morning, church. Please stand if you're able for the call to worship. I'll be reading from Psalm 146, 1 through 2, and verse 6. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, you are worthy of praise. And there is no one like you. You created the heavens and earth. You created us in your image. Father, you know us. You know when we sit or stand. Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit. Remind us who we are in Christ and what you have called us to be. Father, help us through the storm, Father God. Lord, to praise your name. No matter what we go through, Father, may we um, put our eyes on you, for you are worthy. So we lift this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. The presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. I raise a hallelujah. Everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah, I will watch the darkness flee, I raise a hallelujah, in the world of mystery, I raise a hallelujah, You lost your hold on me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, I'm gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, King is alive.
louder.
can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is a victory hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah hallelujah praise the 
one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are. team let us pray lord heavenly father we just thank you so much once again for this awesome privilege to come to your house to worship you and to praise your name lord father we just thank you so much for being with us over the past week in our struggles of daily living uh, we whatever ups and downs we may be facing father god we know that you're in charge of everything and so we thank you for your mercy your grace your forgiveness and your provisions upon our lives we want to lift up a special prayer of thanksgiving for your hands upon our brother ken and bringing him back safely through his illness lord thank you so much for that and also father we know that ultimately all that we have all that we earn uh, belongs to you anyway but we do give a portion of our earnings in, in the form of tithes and offerings to you this morning we pray that the funds may be utilized to glorify your kingdom, Father, on this earth, uh, in the greater Phoenix area and beyond. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Journey of Faith Sunday worship service. I see a lot of new faces as well as old faces that I haven't seen in a while. So welcome. We do have a time of fellowship after the service in the cafeteria, so if you can join us for some food and refreshments and fellowship, that would be fantastic. I do have a lot of announcements today, so let, let's get with it here. So hopefully everyone's keeping track of their Bible reading. Um, luckily, it's only like a chapter a day, thankfully. But yeah, I, I do love seeing all the comments. Uh, people are able to do this on a social media basis. And so hopefully everyone's being blessed through that experience and, and keeping track with the, with the reading. So... Today is the last part of the Bible study that Pastor Derek will be leading. So this is the third part on evangelism. So please join us for that time of fellowship first, and then 1215 in the classroom. Um, sad that it's the last day, Pastor Derek, but uh, I think we've been, <laughs> we've been tremendously blessed through the, the last two sessions. So please join us for that. So next week, so February, I can't believe January is almost over, but February... It is a busy month once again. So anniver anniversary service is next week. Hope hope everyone can join us for that. Time of food. We're going to do bibimbap. That's a Korean kind of traditional dish. Um, very delicious. So ho hopefully everyone can join us for that. As we eat, fellowship, and install our new deacons, Austin, as well as Nat Natalie Click. So come out next week for that. And then... <laughs> Our monthly prayer meeting, ministry leaders meeting. So as you know, we've combined that this year. That will be Tuesday, February 14th, 7.30 via Zoom. So we have the prayer meeting first, and then we transition into the ministry team, meter, uh, team meeting right afterwards. And last item on the February calendar is the welcome dinner, February 25th, 5.30 p.m. If you're new to the church, want to get to know you better, um, please Join us for that. You should receive an evite if you're a newcomer from Janice um, in preparation for that. So we want to welcome you and uh, join us as we celebrate newcomers to the church on February 25th. A couple housekeeping things. So I have tax forms to of your summary of giving. So if you can see me today for that. And uh, also you should see a, a, a box of books out there. There's two books. If you're a deacon, including Austin Natalie, please pick up the deacon's book. And then if you're a ministry leader, please pick up the uh, Improving Your Serve book. That book will be one per family, though. So please pick your books up uh, today. And also, you should have seen a whole thing of lemons. My, my lemon tree is going crazy this year. So <laughs> I bought a bunch of bags. Fill your bags. Take your lemons with you. I mean, I, I, yeah, there's just too much of it. All right, with that, we are blessed and privileged to have 
pastor as well as doctor, actually, uh, Josh Anderson. He's a dean of students at Phoenix Seminary, and we're so blessed to have him from time to time to uh, deliver the message for us. And so thank you, Pastor Josh. And uh, let me turn it over to him now. Thank you so much for having me. It is good to be here again. I think this is my third or fourth time here, and um, I've just really enjoyed it, um, but I'm a little nervous because Pastor Derek is sitting in the front row, so I'll try to do my best. No, um, uh, it's been a joy. Happy New Year. Uh, we are in, in January, almost February. I love a church where they can make personal announcements about lemons. That is great. Um, no, but... Uh, we are, we are here, and I asked Pastor Derek, what would you like me to talk about? And he said, you know, you could talk about something, anything I could talk about. Um, and that's not good for a pastor, because we certainly can talk about anything. Um, but um, he said, I would love to, for you to talk about something about discipleship. And, and so as I'm thinking through and praying through about what to talk about, um, because there's a lot of different passages that we can talk about discipleship. And as I was looking through it, thinking through it, but there isn't really necessarily a job description either about what discipleship is. Um, and so I, what I wanted to do was go through a passage that we see in the book of Acts. But before we get there, I have a passage that I was working through this past week that I didn't intend to connect with this passage but it was really meaningful. Have you ever had those passages where you read through it, you read through it, you read through it for years, and then all of a sudden you see it again for the first time? Sorry about the feedback. If you want me to go to a, a handheld that can do that. which is a little awkward when you're actually going through the passage because there's this new idea that you might have, and you're like, how do you fit it in right in the moment? But it was this passage in Galatians, and you've probably heard it before, but I want to read it again. And it says this, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And I read that as I was giving this Bible study, and it just punched me in the face. And I was looking at it, and I'm like, man, there are so many times where things matter to me, but don't matter to God. I want to get a raise, and that matters to me. And yes, God wants me to make ends meet and provide for my family and give to the church and, and, and do all those things. But in the end of the day, God is not categorizing my spiritual manliness or my spiritual maturity based on how much money I have in the bank. Or maybe I want to get my doctorate, and I've gotten my doctorate. But guess what? When I get up to heaven, Jesus isn't going to call me Dr. Anderson. And when, when I get, I mean, what's absolutely crazy was, was this, neither slave nor free. Because when I look at that passage, I'm thinking, okay, God, there were indentured servants who could not pay their loans back. And so they went back into slavery in order to pay back their loans. And maybe some of them didn't pay it back, and so their kids were in slavery. And yet in Christ, it doesn't matter. God doesn't categorize based on that. And when we think about all the categories that we have in life. Are you married? Are you not married? Are you young? Are you old? What sort of degrees do you have? What sort of race are you? God doesn't categorize based on that. And so when you look at that and you like have to abolish all the categories that you have in your life, then you're like, what really matters to God? And as I go through scripture, as I go through the New Testament, these things come up over and over again. It's the great commandment, great commission, great commandment, great commission. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, if you hold to those two commandments, you've kept the entire Old Testament. Now, it's impossible to keep it, right? Because um, if you just look a day in my life, I don't always act in loving ways, okay? But that's the standard. And so it's not necessarily how high I get up in the echelons in life. As it is, how much do I love the people around me with the love that Christ has in me? And then number two, it's this. It's go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all I've commanded you. The Great Commission to make disciples. So if God wants me to do two things in life, and that is to love and the disciple, then hopefully I have an understanding of what discipleship is all about. And so the question I have for you today is this. What does it look like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Now, the unfortunate thing is that God didn't make job descriptions. Okay? It would have been nice if he made job descriptions. It would have been nice if he categorized those things because I'm a little bit of a type A, over-analytical personality. My wife um, reminds me of that right? That's the type of person I am. And I would love to say that I have all these categories, and if you just do these things, then you're, you're a really good disciple of Jesus Christ, and you're a really good discipler for Jesus Christ. But we don't have that. But what we do have are accounts of people in the Old Testament and New Testament who tried to just follow Jesus with all they had. They didn't carry about the categories of life. And if you're in the upper or lower echelon of life, that's okay. And some of them hopped from one category to the next, depending upon where they were at in their relationship with God. But they lived out an authentic life of following Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to do today. I want to go to a particular passage of a person who was following Jesus And say, if there were some categories that we could take, if there were some things that we could do to emulate a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Jesus Christ, this is what it looks like. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And while you're doing that, I'm going to open up to Acts chapter 20. And I'm going to tell this joke. And it's never funny, but I still like telling you the joke. And that is, if you can't find Acts 20, go to Acts 19, and then go one over. (laughs) I know, not that funny, right? But I love telling it. All right, so here we are. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get started. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you that you don't categorize our lives based on the way the world categorizes lives. But Lord, you simply want us to love you with all that we have and love the people that we encounter every day with all that we have. And you want us to follow you. And so, Lord, as we think through that and as we pray through that and as we go through this passage today, I I just want to um, say that our hearts are open, our minds are alert to what you have to share to us today in following you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, a description of a disciple. What does it look like? And so we are in Acts chapter 20, and this is what has been happening at this point in time. We're going to look at the life of Paul, and we're going to look at a couple passages as it relates to the life of Paul. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 20 and starting in verse 18. But before we get there, this is what's been happening in in Paul's life. You see, Paul was a persecutor of those of the way, those of Jesus Christ. He was a Jewish person who was was being raised up to be a rabbi. He was a disciple of Gamaliel, who was a famous rabbi at that point in time. He was getting his, his education, and he was so zealous in the faith that he was actually persecuting those who followed Jesus Christ. He was actually there giving approval to the first martyr of the church, Stephen. And then once he did that, he started getting... He started getting warrants for the arrest of other believers. And so he was going up to Damascus. And as he was going up to Damascus, he had a vision of Jesus. 
And Jesus told him, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? He's like, Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And in that moment, he was converted and his life completely changed. Not only was his life completely changed spiritually, but his life completely changed physically and socially. He was a follower of Jesus Christ now, and his life proved it. He struggled. He did a a lot of things in in the sense of he, he suffered for the gospel. But he he also had an incredibly profound impact. And one of the impacts that he had was he took missionary journeys. He was one of the first missionaries of the church. Because the church at that point in time was in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. But Paul was the first one to genuinely take it to the uttermost parts of the world. And so he did one missionary journey throughout Europe, and then he came back. And then he did a second missionary journey, and then he came back. And he did a third missionary journey. And the twofold part of these missionary journeys was to make disciples of Jesus Christ and to plant churches and encourage those churches. And he did that over and over and over again three times. But in the midst of that, we also see a lot of persecution that he went through. And he was just finishing up this last, this last missionary journey, and he was headed to Jerusalem. But God had also given him a vision, or had at least spoken to him, that you are going to suffer even more for the gospel. And he's in Ephesus right before he's about to head back to Jerusalem. And this is where he starts off, and this is what we want to look at as it relates to a description of a disciple. And it says in verse 18, It says, and when he came to them, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. We look at that first passage, and what do we learn? Number one, we learn this as it relates to following Jesus Christ. As following Jesus Christ, as a disciple, the description of disciples, we need to value actions before words. Now, there was a famous, um, there was a famous believer, uh, um, St. Francis of Assisi. He, he, he was Catholic, but, but he said something really profound. And he said, share the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Now, sometimes I think that we as believers in Jesus Christ take that too far. And we think that if we are just an example of Jesus, that that is enough. But the reality is we need to articulate the gospel to people in order for them to become saved. But I do think he makes an incredibly important point in that when we take that phrase and we realize that actions are meaningful, that it's not just sharing Jesus, but it's also showing the love of Jesus to those around us. A lot of times we realize that when we have that relational equity with people and we are building that relationship through love and through caring and compassion and kindness, that that opens up an opportunity for us to share the gospel. And as followers of Jesus Christ, if we are going to be a disciple of Jesus, we need to live the way the Apostle Paul said when he said, you yourselves know that I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. That I wasn't just sharing Jesus, that I wasn't just talking about Jesus, but I was actually living him out in our daily life. So we value actions before and while we are sharing the gospel. The second one is this. The disciple of Jesus Christ lives a life marked with humility. It says this in verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. As followers of Jesus Christ, we need to not worry so much about climbing the ladder of success. Should we do that? Yes, it's okay to be successful with your family, with your friends, with your um, at school, with your profession, whatever that is. It's okay to be ambitious. But even more important than that, it is important that we show Christ and share Christ with those around us as we are climbing the ladder. And if in the midst of climbing the ladder, we fall down a little bit, that's okay. And even more than that, as we are climbing the ladder, it is really important that we demonstrate humility and that we don't lord lord our authority over people in a really harmful way. 
When I look at my life as a follower of Jesus Christ, the older and the older that I get, the more and more I value humility because humble people will follow Jesus no matter where Jesus takes them. But have you ever met people who are like, oh, I'm not going to do that? And why? Because their pride gets in the way. I don't want to hang out with that person. Right? That's a really middle school. I remember middle school. I'm not going to hang out with that person because I want to be of a certain, uh, I want to be included in this other group, so I'm not going to hang out with them. But what if Jesus wants you to? Or I'm not going to do this because this is a really high-paying job that I have here, and if, if I do that, then, then it's going to, my job might suffer or it might put it at risk. But what if Jesus wants you to do that? But the person of humility says, you know what, I don't care where God calls me. I don't care what he wants me to do. If he wants me to be president of the United States, or if he wants me to be in the back room with somebody and just show Jesus to them for 30 years before they receive Jesus, then that's what I will do. And here is the Apostle Paul saying, with all humility, I I don't care what people think of me. All I care about is proclaiming Jesus to people around me. And he said, I did it, and and people punched me in the face for it, and they threw rocks at me for it, and they kicked me out of towns for it. But guess what? It didn't matter because I was a disciple of Jesus. I was following Jesus. I was loving people, and I was sharing Jesus with people, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials, that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. We also learn something else in this verse. and That is the description of a disciple. A disciple is faithful to Christ in trial, which which results in a stronger witness. I have a buddy, really good friend, who, um, who got married when he was young. They both loved Jesus. And they were following Jesus. They they went to be missionaries. They came back. They settled back here in town. And then all of a sudden, his wife just stopped following Jesus and divorced him. Now, this could happen to anybody. It could be the guy. It could be the girl. It could be. So it doesn't matter who it is or you know which which person. And and throughout this entire time, I have seen him display nothing but Jesus to his now ex-wife and nothing but Jesus to their three kids and nothing but Jesus to the church where they go and nothing but Jesus to every area of his life. Now, does he struggle? Yes. Does, Does he get angry and upset? Yes. But every time he goes through a difficult situation in this relationship, He brings that anger, he brings that frustration, he brings that sadness, he brings that mourning to the foot of the cross. He's like, God, all I want to do is honor you. Now, do I believe that this man is is a great guy and loves Jesus? Absolutely. And I would have known that whether um, he was going through this difficult situation or not. But man, he has gone through this trial and as he goes through this tr- trial, the, the value that I have in this man for following Jesus just rises to the top even more. So many of us want to be allergic to hardship, right? We don't want to go through it. We don't want to go through that challenging time in our life. We, don't, we, we want life to treat us well. And when I go through life, sometimes my prayers to the Lord are complaining. Like, God, why are you putting me in this situation? Why this? Why that? And yet, as a follower of Jesus Christ, in retrospect, when I look back on my life and look through those difficult times, I see that he is refining me. And I also see that people are looking in on me and seeing how I respond to those things. And when we go through hardship and we continue to follow Jesus Christ, guess what happens? We start loving people in deeper ways. God is able to use us in a deeper way with people who are also suffering 
through the same situation. And we are able to refine our faith so that we can display God even more. And that's what's happening with the Apostle Paul. And that's what happens with us. When we follow Jesus Christ, even through trial, even through difficulties, even through hardship, guess what God is going to do? He's going to redeem that pain. He's going to redeem that suffering. He's going to grow us in our faith. And he's going to put, on, put us on display for others to see that this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. And we are going to have a stronger witness. It continues on in verse 20 and it says this. It says, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. And teaching you in public and from house to house. What do we learn from verse 20? Number, uh, and, and it's this. You, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, a disciple lives out God's word and shares God's word. Why is this so, so meaningful to being a follower of Jesus Christ? Because how many people do you know who do not follow Jesus who will just randomly pick up a Bible and read it and understand it perfectly? And how many people do you know who's at work or in your neighborhood who will just naturally uninvited go to a church because they feel like it? But guess what happens every time, hopefully, they interact with people like you and me? Hopefully, they see Jesus. Hopefully, when they're interacting with you at work, if you are their boss, then they see, wow. I, I, I didn't know who Jesus was before, but I see some of the character of God in this person. Or when you're interacting with your neighbors or when you're interacting with friends. I have friends who don't follow Jesus, but hopefully every time I interact with them, they see the character of Jesus in me, even though they will never pick up a book. And so we live out God's word in our life. And then in addition to that, at the appropriate time, we share God's word and we don't shrink back from it. And this is what the, Apo the Apostle Paul is saying, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. And not just our favorite passages, but every passage of Scripture. And teaching you in public and from house to house. My mom. She went through a really bad divorce. My dad was really abusive. And my mom never really preached me what was going on in Scripture. But one of the top three things in my life was the example that my mom lived out of her faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I was a follower of Jesus before that. I received Christ at a young age. But we went through some really difficult times. And her example of following Jesus through hardship and living it out and those passages that were meaningful to her, sharing it with me, and then also saying, Joshua, I don't know how you're going to get through this, but I'm going to pray for you. And seeing those prayers play into action and seeing God respond to those prayers, those were incredibly meaningful to me. So living out God's word in your daily life is meaningful to people who live in a dark and decaying world. Because Jesus said this, you are the light of the world. And sometimes we complain about how dark the world is, but you know the beauty or the silver lining to that is? All you got to do is shine one little light in that darkness, and it's going to start lighting up the whole room. And as followers of Jesus Christ, when we live out God's word, we are light in that dark, dark world world. My daughter loves to invite people to church. And some of these friends have some difficulties at home. And when they are able to see her living her life out genuinely, she is that light for that moment in time in their dark world. And we as a disciple of Jesus Christ get to do the same thing. It continues on in verse 21. And it says this, it says, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in Jesus Christ. 
we demonstrate consistency and integrity. Because if we combine verses 20 and 21, it looks like this. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. There's that consistency thing. It's saying, what, what is integrity? Integrity is saying, this is what they are like out in public, and this is also what they are like in private. And that they are the same person. They are consistent, whether they are out in front of a crowd, or they are at a party, or they, on Saturday night, or they are here on Sunday morning. They are consistent in their faith. And so here is the Apostle Paul saying, I, I just tried to live it out genuinely. Whether I was out in public preaching in, in Ephesus in front of thousands, or I was going from house to house. And testifying both to Jews and Greeks. It didn't matter who it was. It didn't matter what race you were. I was just preaching Jesus. I was doing it consistently. And I was trying to do it with integrity. The repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. And then it continues on in verse 22. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem. Constrained by the Spirit. Not knowing what will happen to me there. This is what we realize in verse 22, that we get no special favors in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. And so we shouldn't expect it. Sometimes I feel like this, and and in fact, I, I, I hate to admit it, but sometimes I expect maybe special favors from God more often in my life than I should. Like, God, my life should be going better in my relationship with my friends, Or my life should, and this is when I was dating, my life should be going better in my dating life than I expected. Or my life should be be going better with my kids. Or my life should be going better in my relationship with my wife. Or my life should be going better at work. And I shouldn't have this much conflict. Why aren't you coming through for me? But the reality is, as followers of Jesus Christ, there are going to be blessings that God gives us But there's also going to be trial and hardship. And so we don't necessarily expect favors from God. Now, is it good to ask? Yes, ask. Jesus said you do not receive because you do not ask. And so if you need a raise at work in order to make ends meet, then pray for that raise. I'm not saying God's going to necessarily give it to you. But there might be some factors or we need to make ends meet. God, help us provide for us in some capacity. Yes, do that. But we also need to come and realize that life is a battle. And that just because we're followers of Jesus Christ doesn't mean that we are immune or exempt to difficult times. And we aren't going to get favors with God. But it continues on in verse 23 and it says this. It says, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. And so we receive the blessing from God, but we are also not immune to hardship. Okay, we receive blessing from God. I think it's absolutely amazing how God answers prayer in amazing ways that I did not expect. A lot of times when I go into work, this is my prayer to God. God, I have a ton of stuff I need to do. I don't know how I'm going to get it done. Please help me. And this is what's amazing. What's amazing is randomly meetings get canceled and I'm able to work on that project that I need to get done. And amazingly, I come home from work and we have a ton of stuff to do, but but things start fitting into place. And amazingly... My wife and I are in a good financial situation, but, but, but we're in, we have this financial constraint, and, and amazingly, God seems to provide for that. And so I see God's daily mercies every day in my life. I see how he has provided for us and how he has protected us. And yet, at the same time, we see probably one of the most incredible and notable apostles of all time say, I have been before the Lord, and this is what he has told me. He's told me that I'm going to make a million dollars this year, and it's going to be an amazing ride. Is that what happened? No. He said, I go before the Lord, and all I hear from the Spirit of God is that I'm going to suffer hardship. But guess what? 
God redeems that hardship too. And so as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be grateful for the blessing, but we also need to realize that hardship is going to come. And that's okay because God's going to bring it through us, bring it through us too, or bring us through it too. The worst promise of all the Bible is this. In this world, you will have trouble. The night before Jesus died, that's what he told us. But the best promise is right after that. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. And so as followers of Jesus Christ, there's going to be hardship. We aren't immune to it, so don't be allergic to it. Okay? But know this. As you're walking through it, God's going to bring you through it. And God has victory over it. And so we just need to trust and obey. It continues on. Verse 24, and it says this, But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. A follower of Jesus Christ does not glorify, uh, does not glorify self but honors God. There's actually three parts to this verse, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and go through them real quick. He lives by the gospel. The gospel received, the gospel lived out, and the gospel proclaimed. And then lastly, he finishes this strong. We see all of these things in verse 24. Number one, that he does not glorify self, but he honors God. The disciple also lives by the gospel. The gospel received, the gospel lived out, and the gospel proclaimed. And the, the disciple also finishes as strong. What does he say? But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. Now, this is not something you necessarily want to bring up to a follower of Jesus Christ who's just received Jesus and is sort of in the honeymoon phase of following Jesus, right? Hey, just so you know, you got to give your entire life over to him, and it's going to be hard, right? You don't want to do that. Now, life has its blessings, but it also has its hardship. But this is what I find over and over again. I've followed Jesus. I received Jesus around my fourth birthday, my parents say. I'm 44 years old. That means for 40 years, God has had a hold of my life. And I've followed him by his grace and for his glory. And I, I find that there's been some incredible blessings, some incredible answered prayer. God has provided in amazing and miraculous ways. But in the middle of that, too, I've also found that God has asked things of me that have felt like he's ripping my soul out. Because they have been so closely attached to me. And this is what Jesus has asked of me. He's like, Josh... Do you love me more than that? Well, I know what the answer should be, right? But sometimes I also know what the answer is. And I give that over to God. Things like hopes and dreams, things like professional trajectory, things like my marriage, things like my kids. Those are really, really close to me my finances, and I give them over to the Lord. And you know what happens every time I give them over to the Lord? Well, sometimes bitterness, sometimes like, God, I'm giving this over to you. <laughs> but, but as I let that go, a greater and more refined commitment comes in me to follow Jesus, even giving up this because Jesus is worth it. And what I find as I grow older and older in my relationship with God, Paul's words resonate with me. Because when you give over more and more of your life and you become more and more committed to Jesus, what you realize is the only thing that you need in life is Jesus, and the only thing that really matters is Jesus. And so in your life, this, these words begin to resonate more and more. And it's, and it's this, that I do not account my life of any value. Like, like my financial status isn't of any value. What I wear isn't of any value. The relationships that I have aren't of any value compared to following Jesus. 
Because I know that when I cross from this life into the next, those things aren't going to matter, but Jesus is. And loving people for him is. And so we have that. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of his grace. What do we see about Paul's life? That the centrality of his life has been the gospel. That he received it. The good news that Jesus Christ loves us and died for us and rose again for us so that we can have a relationship with God. And then sharing that wherever you are, whether you're a high status or low status, whether you are wealthy or you are poor, whatever race you are, whatever gender you are, wherever you're at, that you are able to love God and love people and show and share the gospel to others. And the only goal we have is to finish that until our last breath. And so if I were to sum all of this up, and I'm not good at summing this top 10 list up about being a disciple, but if I were, it would be this. Be a disciple of Jesus Christ focuses less on themselves and more on God, the gospel, and his glory. That is what a disciple of Jesus Christ is is about. And it's not about like, oh, I'm such a horrible person. That's not what I mean about focusing less on ourselves. Because humility is not thinking little of us, but it's just thinking less about us and more about God and more about others. And so my question to you in this, in thinking about this, and this distilling it to this main point, saying the disciple of Jesus Christ focuses less on themselves and more on God, the gospel, and his glory, then bringing it home, I just have two questions. And it's this, which one of these lists do you resonate with most? Is God like, yeah, I I feel like I'm really doing well there. I feel like, man, I'm I'm growing in, in my ability to show Christ and share Christ to others with my family, with my friends, whatever that looks like. Or, Or whatever it is. Then praise God for that. Because we're all in process And we all have strengths and weaknesses. And when we look at this list, what I don't want you to do is like, wow, i got a lot of work to do, right? Because God has been doing a lot of work in you already. Praise God. That's why you're here. But there also might be some things that might resonate with you in a different way, and that might be conviction. I want you to walk away encouraged like God has me on a path, and God's doing a work in me. But his work isn't done yet. And so where are you struggling? Where, where can God bless you and work more in you? For me, it's hardship. Man, I love the blessing. Man, I don't like the hardship. Right? I like my Saturday afternoon naps. I like my, my checking account full and overflowing. I like my kids perfectly obedient. But they aren't because I'm not perfectly obedient, right? But where are we doing well and where can we do better? Not like hurry up and clean up your face because Jesus is coming to town, but more like, God, here's my life. You can have a full inventory. I invite you into these places and these spaces because I want to look more like you to people around me so that they know the God that is worth loving and serving and following. Because a disciple is simply someone who gives their life to Jesus Christ and says, I'm living it for you, I'm living it for the gospel, and I'm living it for your glory. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we love you. And we know that we love you because you first loved us And we know that you are calling us to follow you. And you are calling us to do things that might be out of what we would normally do, but nothing you would not ask of yourself. And so, Jesus, as we talk about discipleship today, and as we talk about discipling others and being discipled, Lord, there are some things in our lives that that we realize, man, you've had a hold on and you have been working in our lives and we can see the fruit of it and we thank you for it. But God, there's also work to be done in our lives and so we give you our lives.
that you would shape it, that you would mold it, that you would make it so that we can become more refined, so that we can reflect Jesus to everyone around us, so that we can look more like you, and so that we can share the gospel. And even though people might not pick up a Bible or come into church, they would see us and they would see you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, please stand if you're able for the final song. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Josh, Dr. Anderson, whatever you all want to be called. Yeah, I have a doctor too. It doesn't mean anything to anybody, you know, and, and again, God won't say anything. Um, again, remember our mission to glorify God by developing followers, disciples who worship God 
serve one another, and lead others to Christ, which is fulfilled in the great commandment, Pastor Josh brought it up, and the great commission, making disciples. So thank you. If you love Pastor Josh, you're going to hear a lot of him, you know, because I have him like at least once a month. I, I asked him for Easter time, I said, would you like to preach Palm Sunday, Good Friday, or Easter? He said, I'll do all three. I'm like, okay, well, the church pays me to do that, so we're going to give him a couple of services, but I hope you've enjoyed it, and, and God has been good. We have a lot of new people today. Please stay around. We are a church that loves to eat, I, you know, and if God doesn't give us food, we still love God, but it's great to have it. It's good to see some old friends, Chris and Lisa, back, and please say hi to them also afterwards. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the example that the Apostle Paul is to us. Yeah, we would love life to be easy, and we'd love to have it perfect, and we'd love to have all the blessing. But we also know, Lord, if we follow you and you say jump, we need to say how far and how high. So thank you for that lesson. Be with us as we continue to commune together. In Jesus' name, amen. Third Bible study is how to invite friends to church, okay? And that will be at 1215 to 115. We'll see you. God bless you all.